good morning. We'll be in Matthew chapter 5 this morning. You might want to open your Bibles to that passage. We're going to continue our study on the Sermon on the Mount this morning. It's good to be here with you. Good to see everybody. We have a good crowd this morning. It's always a wonderful thing to be together like this on this day for this purpose, to study God's Word, to think about what God has done for us so that we might come closer to Him in our walk of life. Matthew chapter 5, we'll be looking at verses 17 through 20 this morning. Jesus says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth has passed away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of this commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, one of the things about the studying God's Word, I've pulled up the wrong set of charts here. I'm going to have to... I'm going to have to... Nope, I've got the right set. Never mind. I was right even though I thought I was wrong. And one of the challenges I think we might have as modern-day Bible students... Is, is the challenge of perspective. You know, we bring a certain perspective to the Scriptures, whether we realize it or not, that's probably a little bit different from the perspective of those that Jesus was talking to in Matthew 5 or the original audience of basically any passage of Scripture. You see, you and I, we're familiar with the story. As a matter of fact, I imagine most of the people in this room this morning, if, if we went anywhere in the Bible and we just kind of dropped you there, Within a few verses, you, you'd know what's going on. You'd know the story surrounding that passage. Most importantly, probably, you'd know how it ends. You'd know where all of this is, is going. Even if you're not a Bible student, even if you've never read the Bible, if you live in this country, you're probably familiar with several of the sayings of Jesus. You might not know that, but I think it'd be pretty hard to live in this country and have never heard of the Golden Rule. Even Hollywood knows what the Golden Rule is. Sometimes they even describe it in a way that resembles the way Scripture talk about it. Our culture's been influenced by the words of Jesus so much that it's really hard not to know something about who Jesus is and why He came and what He sought to accomplish. That's not the case for the people that Jesus is talking to in Matthew chapter 5. They have a very different perspective. And because of that, they viewed Jesus differently. You and I, if someone said to us, Jesus was a radical, we might kind of shudder at that thought. We might kind of push that thought away just a little bit. We might say, how so? Because so much of what Jesus said is just part of how you and I think today. But I don't think that would have been the case in the first century. Jesus did some things. Jesus said some things that to those people standing there in that time would have seemed very radical. It would have seemed very different from anything that any of the other rabbis or the Pharisees or the Sadducees or any religious leader that they knew anything about. They would have never done or said some of the things that Jesus both did and said in His teaching ministry. And so as we come to a passage like the Sermon on the Mount, we come to a passage like Matthew chapter 5, and we begin to think about, we begin to think about Jesus and who Jesus is and what Jesus says, there's some things that he does and says that, that would have been shocking to the people standing there. That You and I, we probably don't think anything about it. For example, he healed on the Sabbath. He did something good on Saturday. That's how that sounds to you and me. We understand why he did those things. We understand the point of the Sabbath in a way that apparently Jesus, the people in Jesus' day didn't seem to understand. He didn't make his disciples wash their hand every time they ate. They weren't worried about germs in Jesus' day. There were just cleanliness laws that the Pharisees had added onto the law of Moses. Become part of the common culture. And so when Jesus and His disciples did not participate in those traditions, oh, there's something different about this man. He does something in this sermon that would have really bothered people in Jesus' day. And I, I think quite a bit, it would have bothered them quite a bit in, in His particular day. It's the way that He speaks from time to time. Notice how He starts in verse 18. For truly I say to you, no rabbi in Jesus' day would have started a teaching in that manner. I say to you. They would have said something probably similar to the way you and I would talk, the way we see the apostles talk. They might have used a phrase like, it is written. 
or thus saith the Lord. They would have done something to alert their audience. I'm going to teach something, but it doesn't come from me. I don't have the authority to say this. I'm drawing this from God and from God's authority. Jesus, however, comes on the scene. God in the flesh. And He says, I say unto you. And so for all of those reasons, as, as the Pharisees looked at Jesus, as the rabbis looked at Jesus, what they probably saw was this radical, this radical teacher who was liberal in some way, who had a disparaging view of the law of Moses, who wasn't concerned about the prophets and what the prophets taught. And so Jesus, I believe, is addressing that concept in this particular section of the sermon, telling them, no, that's not at all the case. As a matter of fact, what he wants you to see is that he actually has a deeper respect for the law than the traditional religion of the day. And I want to emphasize that word tradition. Because so much of what they conflated with the law was actually of their own creation. So much of what Jesus did that bothered them had nothing to do with what Moses said, had everything to do with what they had decided Moses meant to say. And Jesus comes on the scene and says, wait a minute wait a minute, let's, let's stick to what the Bible actually says. Let's sp- stick to what Moses actually taught. In doing so, he demonstrates a greater respect for the law and for the prophets than the rabbis and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It's interesting to me how this section of Scripture confronts a modern day religious error, one that we see so often. You know, it seems to me that that most of the denominations, if you go and you you read what they write and you you listen to the sermons that that the preachers in these various denominations present, there, there seems to be this drive, this desire to set grace at odds with law. In other words, if if we're saved by grace, if we come into a relationship with God by grace, then law has no part in it. We don't want to talk about obedience. We don't want to talk about commandments. We're just going to talk about grace. God's grace is what saves us. That's true. God's grace is what saves us. But it's interesting to me that the embodiment of that grace, Jesus the Christ, when He's preaching and teaching, He talks about commandments. He talks about obedience. And He talks about those things in the context of entering into the kingdom. He talks about those things in the context of being in fellowship with God. He talks about those things very differently than the way so many of the religions today want to talk about grace and law. He doesn't set them at odds. Instead, what Jesus does is He demonstrates that man's faith and God's law are deeply intertwined. It's almost as if he says you can't have one without the other. Or at least that you can't have faith without submitting yourself to the law. So with those things in mind, let's let's dig into this text a little bit. And I want to notice a couple of important terms there in verse 17. And then we're going to, we're going to move on and talk about some important principles that Jesus is, is driving at that I think affect how we respond to God and to God's Word today. He says there in verse 17, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. That word translated abolish there means to cause to be no longer in force, to annul, to make invalid. It's typically translated as destroy. As a matter of fact, I think in Matthew, every other time you see that Greek term, it's the word to destroy. It's the idea of tearing something down. It's the idea of diminishing it by by mistreating it. Jesus says that's not what I'm doing in in the way that I preach and teach and in the way that I live my life. I did not come to abolish, to destroy the law or the prophets. Absolutely nothing Jesus says, and I can't emphasize this enough, nothing that Jesus says is intended to devalue or to harm the law. He wasn't trying to pull people away from Moses. That really wasn't His point. It wasn't His purpose. Instead, what he does is he he, he talks about what the law truly is. We're going to get into this as we get into Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, on through the end of the chapter. So much of what Jesus does in his preaching is kind of pull away all those things that hide the purpose of the law of Moses and show that it was intended to bring people to Christ. 
healed. As Paul talks about the Old Testament, he says that it was a schoolmaster or a tutor to bring men to Christ. Jesus says, I did not come to destroy, to tear down the law. I did not come to abolish the law. But instead, Jesus says, that he came to fulfill the law. And this is an interesting word. There's a little bit of controversy about what this word is intended to mean here in Matthew chapter 5, but I want you to notice how Matthew uses this term in other contexts. It's the idea of bringing something to a predetermined end. Turn over to Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. We read about the virgin birth of Jesus. We read about the angel coming and, and telling Joseph and telling Mary about Jesus. Verse 22 says, Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. And then he quotes Isaiah 7 and there in verse 14. So what's happening with Joseph and Mary and the birth of this child is bringing to a predetermined end what Isaiah had said in Isaiah chapter 7 and there in verse 14. You might turn to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3 and there in verse 11. Jesus says something similar there about, about or excuse me, John the Baptist says something similar there about baptism as for me i baptize you with water for repentance but he who is coming after me is mightier than i <clears throat> and i am not fit to remove his sandals he will baptize you with the holy spirit and with fire and so there's there's something that's happening here there's something that must happen we drop down to verse 15 we see what it is but jesus answering said to him permitted at this time talking about his own baptism for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he permitted him. There's something John the Baptist was doing. And it was pointing to the coming of Jesus Christ. And it was in his baptism that, that that thing was going to be brought to fruition, isn't it? As the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus and identifies him as being the true Son of God. Matthew chapter 26. We see the same usage in Matthew chapter 26. That idea of fulfilling bringing something to a predetermined end. Matthew chapter 26, and there in verse 54, as Jesus has been betrayed, betrayed and arrested, it says, How then will the Scriptures be fulfilled, which say that it must happen this way? So all those Old Testament prophecies that point to the suffering of the Messiah are being brought to their predetermined end in the arrest and the suffering of Jesus Christ. Jesus says about John the Baptist, he says that in chapter 11 and verse 13, all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. So all of these, these prophets, all of their work was pointing to a specific moment in which the work that they had done, the prophecies that they had uttered, they would be brought to pass, they would be fulfilled. And so Jesus says, all of this is happening in me. I'm the one who's coming to bring all of this about. When you go and you read the law of Moses, it's all pointing to Jesus. Do you read the Old Testament that way? As you're reading the stories of Genesis and Exodus, do you, do you look in those for Jesus? Do you, do you seek to find how does this tie into the, the message of Jesus? Because I promise you that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. I mean, you think about Genesis and Exodus, what are they talking about? Well, it's the formation of Israel, isn't it? It's the formation and then the redemption of Israel. It's the bringing of a nation of God's people into the promised land. All of this points forward to Jesus, doesn't it? Jesus, who is going to come and create a new people. A new people who serve God to do what? To then redeem them and lead them into that promised land. Jesus came to fulfill the law. You know, there's some things we need to think about in relation to that. And I want you to think with me this morning about how we use the Old Testament and how we speak of the Old Testament. Jesus says, I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Now turn over with me to Ephesians chapter 2 because there's a principle I think we've got to get in our minds. Ephesians chapter 2, we find that the New Testament teaches that the old law has been taken away. As a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 5, and there in verse 18, Jesus talks about the fact that when all these things have been fulfilled, then the Old Testament will be taken out of the way. Notice what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning there in verse 14. 
Let's go back to verse 13. He says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in His flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in Himself He might make two into one new man, thus establishing peace. That law of commandments contained in ordinances is the Old Testament. So when Jesus dies on the cross, and when He is raised from the tomb, when the Gospel is preached, we see a transition, don't we? There's a movement from one covenant to the next. From the old covenant, which was governed by the law of Moses, to the new covenant, which is governed by the law of Christ. And that made something possible that really wasn't possible under the old law. The old law was given to the Jews. It was never given to the Gentiles, never intended for the Gentiles. It wasn't a law for the Gentiles. And so for the Gentile to be brought into the grace of God in Jesus Christ, that law had to go away. That was a separating point, a dividing point among men. And yet Jesus comes and he, he does away with that. If we're talking about the old law in the sense of a means of justification, the way that someone seeks to be made right with God, the old law has no value today as a means of justification. Justification is found only by faith and faith in Jesus Christ. But I want you to think a little deeper with me this morning. I want you to think a little bit more about the old law because there's more in the old law than just commandments that are intended to govern the nation of Israel. There is an ethic revealed in the old law and that ethic is one that I would suggest to you this morning supersedes the covenants. As you read through the old law, what is being revealed to you there is the nature of God. You see, God's commandments show us what righteousness is. Righteousness, that which is good, that which is right, is a reflection of the character and the nature of God. It's an objective thing. And what God does in God's law is He, he shows us the shape of that character. He shows us the shape of that nature. And so when you're reading through you know, Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and you're kind of having trouble staying awake, right? Why did God write all this down? Why do I need to read all this? Well, it's a description of who God is. And not only is it a description of who God is, and I think this is what Jesus' audience is missing out on, it's not only a description of who God is, it's a description of the heart of the one who seeks God. Brother, some of these things just don't change. The God we serve today is the God that delivered the law of Moses. The God that delivered the law of Moses is the God who spoke to the patriarchs. God is unchanging. God's nature, God's character, it does not change. And so in this sense, the law, and I'm talking about the Old Testament, continues to have great value for us today, even though we live under this old law. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of James. And I think we can point this out and show this. In James chapter 2, I've always struggled with this passage. In James chapter 2, and I'm going to be honest with you, what I've typically done because I've struggled so much with this passage, I just observed the Passover. I just kind of read it and moved on, right? I didn't know what to do with it. And then as, as I was sitting and thinking about what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount and the way that He speaks about the law and its value, it's obvious to me Jesus is not saying the value of the law passes at a certain point, but rather it's its ability to govern God's people ends at a certain point. And that helped me to see this with James, this idea of an ethic that supersedes covenant. You know, in James chapter 2, he begins by talking about this, this idea of hypocritical love. Two men enter into the assembly. I think he's talking about the worship service of a local church. That's how we talk about it today. One of them is rich, one of them is poor. The poor man, they give the worst seat in the house. The rich man, they give the best seat in the house. James says, don't do that. Don't have love with hypocrisy. Don't treat the rich man so well because you think you can get something from him and treat the, rich, the poor man so poorly because you think there's nothing that he has to offer. He says in verse 8, If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law, listen to this, 
according to the Scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing well. And I want to be real clear, he's not quoting Jesus there. You and I, we hear that phrase, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We probably think about Matthew and Mark's statements along those lines, recording the life of Jesus. Odds are Matthew and Mark aren't written yet when James is writing this. And so when James says, according to the Scriptures, that which is written, he's not talking about something that hadn't been written yet. He's talking about the old law. He's talking about the book of Leviticus, where we find Jesus quoting from, even when Jesus says that. So get a hold of this. Here's James. He's a New Testament author. He's writing to people about their behavior in the local church, the New Testament church. And he says, stop doing what you're doing. And, and to, to give his authority, to give his reasoning, where does he go? Leviticus. Leviticus. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But he goes on, verse 9. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. How can a Christian be convicted by the law? Verse 10, For whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not commit murder. Now, If you do not commit adultery but you commit murder, you become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. It seems to me to be the gospel that he has under consideration by the law of liberty. How is it that James could teach us about New Testament faith and in the sin of partiality using Old Testament laws and Old Testament commandments and Old Testament principles? Well, the only way I can understand that is the ethic expressed in those laws is true regardless of the covenant. Consider the admonition against murder. Is James saying that it's a sin to murder because thou shalt not murder is either the sixth or the seventh commandment of the Ten Commandments? Is that what James is saying? I don't think so. No, as a matter of fact, that's not why murder is a sin, is it? Murder was just as sinful when Cain murdered Abel before man had ever heard of the old law as murder was sinful after Mount Sinai and the Ten Commandments were delivered in Exodus chapter 20. Why? It's a violation of the nature of God. That's the simplest answer. It's a violation of the nature of God. And so there is an ethic there that transcends the covenant. James is not citing these passages because they're found in the Ten Commandments. That's not his point. No, he's using the Old Testament to demonstrate that true faith keeps God's law. You cannot be a servant of God with partiality. You cannot be a disciple of Jesus Christ if you don't learn to love your neighbor. John's going to do the same thing in 1 John, all through 1 John, but especially in 1 John chapter 3, as he talks about the necessity of love to be in fellowship with God. Again, here's a man writing at the end of the first century, certainly writing to the New Testament church, living in Ephesus in all likelihood when he writes the book, writing to a church that's filled with Gentiles. And in 1 John chapter 3, when he wants to show us that you must love your neighbor, where does he go? Genesis. Genesis, he talks about Cain and Abel. Why? Because there's an ethic there. There's an ethic there that transcends covenant, that transcends time, that's as true for you and I today as it was in the days of Cain and Abel, as it was in the days of Moses or the days of David. Why is that? Because of what the law does. The law describes for us the character and the nature of an unchanging God. And that character and that nature remains the same today as it was in the days of whomever you might want to think of. So I think we need to be careful. We need to be careful that we don't develop a dismissive attitude of the Old Testament that we don't become students of half the book. Thinking that all that matters is the New Testament because I'm a New Testament Christian. And failing to recognize and understand the value of God's law to Israel in our everyday life. We ought to study it. Why? So we can better understand the nature of God and the nature of the kingdom. I want you to think about how the first Christians became Christians. 
When Philip goes to Samaria, what did he use to teach the Samaritans about Jesus Christ? I know what I would use. I'd probably go to Philippians chapter 2. That's my favorite passage about Jesus. And it teaches the deity of Jesus, and it teaches the, the heart of Jesus, and it teaches that Jesus came to save the world. I'd probably go to Philippians chapter 2, and I'd start about verse 4, and I'd work my way down through that text, and we'd talk about Jesus. And then as I taught about Jesus, as it came time to teach about baptism, oh, I don't know, my favorite baptism passage is Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. So I'd probably turn over there and we'd talk about baptism from Colossians chapter 2. Philip couldn't do any of that, could he? Paul hadn't even become a Christian yet when Philip goes to Samaria and begins to teach the gospel. He certainly can't quote Paul to teach them about Jesus probably another 20 years before the first gospel is written. What does Philip use? He used the Old Testament. He used the Old Testament. He used what the prophets said about Jesus to identify Jesus and to explain to people who Jesus was and what Jesus came to do. He used the old law to identify who God is and his character and his nature and shared within the gospel without having the New Testament. Brethren, we should never be dismissive of the Old Testament. And I can hear it now. It sounds like Sean's saying we still live under the Old Testament. That's not what I'm saying. Someone says, well, Sean, what about, what about certain laws that don't seem to have application to us today? Should we be concerned with them? Should we treat them the same as we might treat thou shalt not murder? Should I be concerned about dietary laws today because the law of Moses is important and valuable and shows me the nature of God? No, I would say that there's no reason for that. Why? Because Jesus fulfilled the purpose of those laws. In Jesus, all things are made clean. Remember Peter's dream in Acts chapter 10? Before he was sent to teach the Gentile Cornelius, he has a dream, right, in which a great sheet is laid down and let down. And what's in that sheet? All sorts of animals, both clean and unclean. And what's the command that's uttered? Peter, rise, kill, and eat. Not so, Lord. Peter says, I, I've never eaten anything unclean. He has a dream again. Not so, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean. What is he told? Do not call unclean that which God has made clean. Those laws have met their end. They've met their purpose. Their purpose was to bring us to Jesus. We have accomplished that. You know, we might talk about some other laws in the Old Testament. Are we supposed to keep the Sabbath day today? No. Why? Because there's no value in that? No. Because Jesus is our rest. It's not that we should do away with the entire principle of Sabbath. No. We just need to recognize where we find our Sabbath. Our rest is not in a day. Our rest is in the salvation offered us by Jesus Christ. That's what he says in Matthew chapter 11, right? When he tells the weary to come to him, why? I will give you rest. I will give you rest. No, I think we need to be careful with how we treat the old law. I think we need to be careful when we talk about the fact that the old law has passed away, which it certainly has. But we don't speak of the old law in a way that Jesus would never speak of that law. Jesus never diminished that law. Jesus never devalued that law. Do we have a new covenant? Yes. Is it a better covenant? Yes. Do we have a new high priest? Yes. Is it a better high priest? Yes. Do we have a new promise? Yes. Is it a better promise? Yes. That's the book of Hebrews in a nutshell, right? Does that mean there's something bad about the old law? No. No, I, I think it's, it's beliefs like that that allow people to put grace and obedience at odds. I'll even hear my brethren talk sometimes about the difference in the Old Testament and the New, and they'll say, well, under the New Testament we have grace, and under the law they had obedience. Brethren, that is not a fair division of the covenants. The very fact they were given the covenant was grace. And why we're saved by grace. Saving faith is obedient faith. Well, let's move on. Let's talk about the law and the kingdom. Back over Matthew chapter 5, there in verse 19, whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. 
of heaven. So there's this, this, this accusation that's being made about Jesus being liberal in his application of the law. Because as we studied in John chapter 9 this morning in our Bible class, Jesus healed some people on the Sabbath. Because his disciples didn't wash their hands when they ate some grain. Because Jesus came as the Messiah and spoke as the Messiah. It's an interesting word he uses there, annuls. The Greek term translated annul there in verse 19, it means to loosen, to unbind, to unfasten. That's why I've used the word liberalism or liberal this morning. What they're saying is that he's taking a loose view of the law. And Jesus says, no, not only am I not taking a loose view of the law, but whoever does that can't enter into the kingdom of heaven. I don't think what Jesus says there in verse 19 has ever changed, do you? For so many today who want to see that distinction and, and, and put grace and obedience at odds and say that we're not under law today, you are saying the very opposite thing that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 19. Jesus says the very opposite than what, what so many in the religious world today want to say about God and about His commandments. Even the phrasing that He used when He talks about the least of the commandments and the least in the kingdom of heaven. I think he's probably using the language of the Pharisee. I think he's probably using the language of, of the religious people around him who seem to like classifying things in this way. Jesus isn't saying some commandments aren't important, nor is he saying there's levels of reward. He's making fun of their perspective of the law and demonstrating even in that that it was they, it was they who had the liberal position, if you'll allow me to use that phrase, regarding the law in the law of Moses. And this is really what he gets at in the heart of the sermon. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 21, really on through chapter 7, he, he spends his time showing how their misconceptions about the law, how their particular applications of the law had really missed, had really missed that ethic that we're talking about found in the law. They didn't appreciate the law fully because of the way they treated the law. I look at just a couple of the things that Jesus says here in Matthew chapter 5. Where he employs this, you have, heard that you, that you have heard that it was said, but I say unto you formula. He uses it several times in Matthew chapter 5. Look at what he says in Matthew chapter 5 and there in verse 27. This may be the easiest place to see the idea. He says, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in her heart. The Pharisees were very concerned with that which was outward. They were very concerned with the ceremony of the law. They were very concerned with it appearing as if they kept the commandments. And Jesus says that is not enough. Jesus said it's not just that which is outside. It's not just that which is outward. It's the transformation of the heart that's required. And don't misunderstand me. Jesus is not saying transform your heart instead of this outward sign of obedience. No, he's saying the two must work hand in hand. Do not commit adultery, not because you've just restrained from the physical act. Do not commit adultery because you're pure in your heart. Because your heart has been shaped by these commandments which reveal to us the very nature of God. The very heart of God. Drop down to verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If you go back and you read in the Old Testament about this idea of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, People today say that. They're talking about vengeance. That's not what Moses was talking about. It was a limiting principle is what it was. It prevented the kind of feuds that we've seen in our country where entire bloodlines have been exterminated over some nonsense slight. In other words, go no further. But as the Jews tend to do, they took it a little wrong. And in the first century, what they wanted to do was make sure they went that far. Jesus says that's not the heart of the law. Think about how merciful God was with Israel throughout her history. Think about the book of Judges. 
Think about everything we read about in First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, how often Israel left God and how often God was willing to be merciful and kind and forgiving to her. Shouldn't we have that same heart? Shouldn't we have that same attitude? Yes, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, that's the law, that's the limiting principle. But shouldn't there be something in our heart that says, is that necessary? Or, or can I show mercy in the moment? Verse 43, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Well, there's a misapplication of the law of Moses. But I say to you, love your enemies. So they had failed to appreciate this, this idea of a transformed heart, and it caused them to miss the point of the law. You know, look at Matthew chapter 15. I won't spend much time there. We were in this passage just a couple of weeks ago. But isn't that the point? Isn't that what Jesus is saying? His disciples didn't eat their, wash their hands before they ate their bread. The Pharisees come out and basically charge them with blasphemy because of this or with sin because of this. Notice what Jesus does in verse 5. Or verse 4, God said, honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of father and mother is to be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever I, have, uh, whatever I have that would help you has been given to God. He is not to honor his father and his mother, and by this you invalidate the word of God for the sake of your tradition. So what the Pharisees had done is they'd looked at their elderly parents and said, that'll be a lot of work, I don't want to do it. But there's this commandment, honor your father and mother, and that word honor doesn't mean respect. It literally means to bear up under to carry the weight of. Well, they didn't want to carry that weight. So what they do? They made up their own rule. If you don't want to take care of your elderly dying parents, you don't have to. Just go give some money to the temple and you can say, what I would have used to care for my parents, I've given to God and therefore I don't have to. You talk about having a hard heart. That's what they were doing. Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you, verse 7. Or say, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart, their heart is far from me. Why? Because they tried to obey the law. That's what people want to tell us today. Well, if you're very worried about obedience, then you're, then you're not worried about the heart. Brethren, that's a distinction Scripture never makes. What Jesus is saying is they weren't worried about obedience. They weren't concerned with obeying God as they ought. Why? Because they never recognized that ethic that permeates the law. They never asked, why did God tell us to do what God told us to do? They didn't see what it pointed to. They didn't see what it truly required of them. I'm turning over to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, Jesus offers probably the sternest rebuke that we find anywhere in scriptures as he talks about the Pharisee and what the Pharisee had become. Notice verse 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law. I think that's important. What's he saying? The smallest of the garden herbs, you measure them out precisely, you give a tenth to the Lord. As if that's the most important thing. But you ignore the weightier provisions of the law. Like what? Justice and mercy and faithfulness. Now here's the key. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. Again, no division, no division between obedience and heart, obedience and mercy, obedience and love. No, Jesus isn't saying one or the other. You should have done both, he says. You should have done both. But because they did not, and because of the way they taught about the law, those who followed them, as Jesus says earlier, became twice the son of hell. Notice what he says in verse 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee first, cleans the inside of the cup and of the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also. Allow God's Word, God's commandments to transform your heart. To change those things that you're seeking in this life. And then what will happen? Brother, how you act will follow. That's what repentance is, isn't it? Is, isn't it? 
It's a change of heart and a change of mind that leads to a change of life. I change what I'm seeking. That changes how I think. That changes how I behave. I think so often what we want to do is the other way around. We want to treat the gospel like a behavior modification system. It's, this, it's, it's a shock collar that we put on like we might put on a dog. And whenever we're going to do something we shouldn't, it kind of slaps us down. What happens then? I've got one of those collars for my dog. You know what she does when I get it out of the drawer? She leaves the room. She leaves the room. Why? Because she knows, odds are, if I put that on her at some point, she's getting a little shock. Brother, that's how you treat the Bible. What happens to your love for God's Word? If all the Bible is in your life is something that tells you when you're doing wrong and reminds you you're going to hell, how long are you going to enjoy reading the Bible? Not very long. Not very long. But if what you're using God's word for is, is, is a guide to help you understand what it is that you need in this life, understand what it is that's good and desirable, shape what you love, it'll change how you think. How you think about what? Absolutely everything. How you think about God's word, how you think about yourself, how you think about the world that you're in. What will that do? Well, that will absolutely change how you act. absolutely change how you act pharisees didn't do that they whitewashed the tomb they washed the outside of the cup and inside they were filled with dead men's bones their hearts their hearts simply were not transformed you see what jesus presents for us is a righteousness but a righteousness different than the scribes and the pharisees what jesus presents for us it is a righteousness of heart, a righteousness of affections that leads to a righteousness of actions. Do you think about that with me? Any attempt, any attempt to put grace and faith at odds with one another fails to recognize and fails to understand this particular principle. When we do that, what we do is we loosen, we unbind, we unfasten that which God has given to us. Brethren, the Christian is not called on to keep every commandment in the Old Testament. Certainly that's, that's the case. But we are called on to participate in that same ethic. That same understanding of God in His nature which transforms us, which changes us. Turn to Romans chapter 10. We'll see it again. This, this absolute need for transformation. Romans chapter 10. And there in verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Someone says, why can't I just claim love for God? Why can't I just say that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Why, why can't I just find joy in that? Well, brother, I hope that you do. But Christianity is more than a claim, and Christianity is more than a feeling. Faith is more than a feeling. It cannot be realized apart from our submission to God. Our obedience to God, to be, a, to be a citizen in the kingdom of God absolutely demands that I obey His commandments. Apart from that obedience, I cannot be in His kingdom. I've been reading a man named Scott McKnight, his comments on the sermon. And talking about this idea of righteousness, which is what we've been describing for the past several minutes, he says righteousness in verse 20 refers to behavior that conforms to the will of God is taught by Jesus. And then he goes on to call that covenant behavior. Brother Kenny Chumley in his commentary on Matthew says the kingdom righteousness calls by, for the obedience, listen to this, calls for the obedience of faith in Christ rather than faith in your obedience to Christ. 
And I think that's powerful. What he's saying is that what we have faith in is Christ's ability to save us as we obey in Him rather than having faith in our ability to be so good that God will save us. He's talking about that transformation of heart that sees self differently, that sees God differently, that leads us to conformity with His will. I appreciate your attention this morning. I may have said some things about the old law you hadn't thought about. You stuck with me. Nobody threw anything at me. I got a couple of weird looks, but we made it through. This is such a powerful portion of Scripture, and I think it's one that frames the rest of the sermon, but maybe more importantly than that, frames our relationship with God and how we can come to have one. If you're here this morning and you're not a child of God and you're seeking that relationship, let me tell you what God says you need to do. You need to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You need to repent of your sins. You need to change the way that you're living. Romans chapter 10, there in verses 9 and 10, we find out that we must confess Jesus with our mouth in order to be saved. We need to do that. And then we find out that we need to meet Jesus in the waters of baptism. I mentioned Colossians chapter 2 just a few moments ago. What Paul says is that it is in the waters of baptism that Jesus cuts away our sin. Romans 6, he'll tell us that having done that, we can rise to walk in newness of life, free from sin. What a beautiful concept. Maybe you've done all those things and you've entered into that relationship, but you've sinned, you've transgressed, you've moved away from your Lord. Well, you know what you need to do. You need to repent of your sins. You need to confess them before your God. And you need to beg Him to forgive you as He is faithful and just to do. If we can help you with any of that in any way this morning, why don't you let us know right now while we're singing.